Hello and welcome to Epic Mickey, also known as Disney Epic Mickey. Oh wow, like that's it. That whole UI, that takes me back. Mm. It takes me <laughs> back to September of 2022 when I recorded this footage. <laughs> oh wow, okay. This game is a third-person action platformer developed by most of the creative talent from Ion Storm Dallas and Looking Glass Studios, including lead director Warren Spector, who worked on Deus Ex. Well, interesting. This has a pedigree. Very nice. There are definitely going to be interesting things happening. And joining me are PD Precious Roy. Hello. And Blastinus. Howdy, howdy. A long time ago, on a very oh. peculiar oh. day, my midder lured someone out of his bed. He said he could help him save money on his car insurance. <laughs> opened the doorway huh? to my workshop. Oh, this is cute. There's nothing sinister here. I do not know if the mirror was being mischievous <laughs> or malicious. Oh, he's been red pilled. Oh, no. Mickey, don't start looking up QAnon. <laughs> please don't. I know that a Q kind of looks like the shape of your ears, but please don't do it. Also, hey, Yen Sid. I was putting the finishing touches on my latest creation. A world for things that have been forgotten. Oh, Fantasia reference right off the bat. And I painted it nothing but blue. <laughs> uh, despite the appearance of Yen Sid, there is no connection between this and the Kingdom Hearts universe. Uh, or Fantasia, which they just pulled a few notes from. There is an in-story reason as to why there are so many Disney references, despite not taking place in our world at all, including the, the whole, like, the first 30, 45 seconds of this cutscene was, like, a direct shot-for-shot -shot remake of the opening of Through the Mirror, which is a classic Disney short for the 40s. Had I known what events would follow, I would have locked away everything. Paint, brush, and thinner. So important lesson, kids, always clean up after your art projects, because otherwise you have like six year olds running around trying to eat paint. <laughs> or in this case, someone who really ought to know better. Like, where is Mickey at this point in his heroic development? And this is the thing. One of the goals of this game was to bring Mickey's personality closer to how it was in the classic shorts, where he was, you know, a well-intentioned prankster who didn't know when to stop fucking with things. Yeah, it's the Phantom Blot. Keep out to find out. Flawless. No one will ever know you were here. Oh, yeah. P the perfect crime. s rank stealth mission, Mickey. Great job. I heard the noises and rushed to see what had happened. But I was too late. The world I had created was ravaged. A wasteland. The mysterious intruder was gone. I did not learn his identity. Well, not for a very long time. Decades, apparently. Yeah, basically about 70 years pass from the uh, that initial little oopsie with the art project. So we are now officially in the find out portion. <laughs> there is no Dana, only Zool. Wow, he's dead. Tragic. This is a pretty short game. <laughs> so that's the opening cutscene. Welcome to Epic Mickey. <laughs> right off the bat, we're giving kids nightmares. I mean, I don't think that's going to stop, but, you know, 
at least they're setting a nice precedent. Now, this game does have three save files, but it also has a very, very strict autosave system, which means that practicing for this Let's Play was a nightmare. Almost as much of a nightmare as what Mickey just went through. <laughs> I mean, he appears to be um, melting a little bit. Yeah, that's not important to the story or anything. Just ignore it. Florida, what's happened to you? Oh no, Mickey's in the 99% of Florida that isn't Walt Disney World. <laughs> now, this character, I'm not going to talk about him that much, but I will say for the moment that he is not an original character. He is actually a very important part of Disney history, but we'll get to that later. Oh, dang, why is it gotta be like bloodshot on the sides? Oh, get out the scissors. All right, get out the, uh, get out the drill. I do like that it's a Swiss army knife. Yeah. I think his surgery would be a lot more successful if he didn't keep getting bored all the time. Hmm, nah, we gotta bring out the big guns for this. No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. Dang. Are you sure we can show this? Like, this is pretty hardcore stuff. This game is rated E10+. Plus. If it could get past the SRB, it could get past us. And YouTube. But this might encourage kids to pull out people's hearts with plungers. It'll be an interesting anatomy lesson for them. I think that is the most badass that anyone has ever been while wielding a paintbrush. Bob Ross would like a word. I'm actually just kind of curious as to why the Phantom Blood is more of a like generic monster villain now. At least in the uh, in the comics, he was more of a almost like a gangster, like pulling off various heists. I will say that that character is not the Phantom Blood, but his design is definitely inspired by him. Wow, oh, interesting. I'll be saying that phrase a lot. The inspired by and influenced by various parts of Disney history. Kind of combination of the Phantom Blot and Oogie Boogie from The Nightmare Before Christmas. For example, this guy is, well, he's not an obscure character himself, but he is based on an obscure part of Disney history. Dark Beauty Castle, eh? So, our first objective is to escape from this giant Swiss army knife. Uh, and he was created by The Mad Doctor, a villain from a classic, I think it was 1929 short. Uh, although he was originally known as Dr. Triple X. His name was changed for obvious reasons. Hmm, yeah, I could see how that might have connotations. Well, surprisingly, I did a bit of research. Apparently, the the connection between Triple X and porn is something that only came around in the 60s. Hmm. So, this game is exclusive to the Nintendo Wii, so of course, we've got motion controls. Most of the time, it's done pretty well. Uh, don't do what I do. Uh, those barrels are not particularly worth it. Uh, although this is really just an, an extended tutorial for basic movement. Yeah, this thing seems to be very fond of just kind of posing menacingly. Does it ever actually, you know, attack? Oh, well, that answers my question. <laughs>
Oh, so in order to open that door, you have to actually destroy all your expensive machinery? Yeah, it's it's where he keeps his uh, DC comics and stuff like that. Anything that's not owned by Disney. Gotta stash them somewhere. This is Dark Beauty Castle, uh, the first area of the game. Although, we can go down and explore this part. Now, there's a piece of collectible concept art over there. Normally, you have to exit the game and uh, go into a separate menu to view the concept art. But uh, in the interest of streamlining this Let's Play, I have provided uh, visual pop-ups for your convenience, so every time we collect some concept art, you'll get to see it. And that's the rabbit we met earlier. That's Oswald. Apparently, the king likes to go out and do his own business. That's nice. It's always nice to see an active member of the monarchy. For sure. And in this chest over there is one of the other major collectibles in this game. Just beat the devil out of it, Mickey. You collected ears? Yeah. It is a collectible pin. Uh, for those of you who may not know, collecting and trading pins at the Disney theme parks is serious fucking business. So this is a nod to that hobby. Uh -huh. And speaking of the theme parks, uh, the design for this area is based mostly on uh, Sleepy Beauty's castle as it appears in Disneyland Paris formerly known as Euro Disney. Why are we wanting to harken back to that? Because, I mean, they, they're still losing money on it. They gotta make it back somehow. Although I guess it's appropriate that the, uh, the evil sinister castle is in the theme park that's failing. Yeah, that's a recurring theme. This area is known as the Wasteland, a thing for, or an area <laughs> for cartoons that are forgotten and obsolete or that never were. Just like Paris. The entire city, not just the theme park. <laughs> and this is what most of the cutscenes look like in this game. Very cool style. Gus, please stop trying to let's play. That's my job. One surprise, apparently, is that, uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of a little bit juicy. Yep, the, uh, the drips that are coming off of Mickey there, uh, when Mickey was dragged into the wasteland by the, okay, his name is a shadow blot, uh, a variant on, on the phantom blot, uh, the two kind of merged. Uh, the Shadow Blot still exists, but uh, a bit of the Shadow Blot is stuck inside Mickey. So maybe there are a few Kingdom Hearts references. Something, something, light, darkness. So the magic paintbrush is the central mechanic of this game. You can either restore lost tune by painting it in, or you can remove uh, tune objects with thinner, which it, it kind of works like the dip from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Probably the best comparison. Oh yeah, the, the, although the dip was a combination, I think, of both like um, ink remover, paint thinner, like it was supposed to be like a, sort of a catch-all, like get rid of all kinds of tunes. That's basically how it works in this game, but it's just called thinner. So I guess with everything being like computer animation these days, what you want is like a big electromagnet these days. <laughs> and uh, I I will say that the ability to restore or uh, to restore any of the walls or make them disappear at any time, uh, this game has a pretty notorious camera, which we'll see many examples <laughs> of far, much later in the game. Uh, yeah, it's I. I hate the camera too, but I at least understand why it's so terrible. It, it's a Wii game. It's par for the course. 
Yeah. It does actually remind me a little bit of uh, Super Paper Mario, where you could scan things in order to make them suddenly like be revealed. I don't know if you ever played that game. I I have it, and I played a bit of it years ago. I think it, I think the furthest I got was the uh, the part where you had to run, where you had to run around in a ball uh, to to pay back a debt of some sort. I remember that. Yeah, that was that was pretty fun. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, huh? So already this is another one of those quirky Wii titles, huh? One of the things I really like about this game is that it does an excellent job of introducing like a morality system with real choice and consequence, but it does it in a system that a younger audience could understand because this game is meant for like those 12 and under. Yeah, I'm guessing they, they wouldn't want to like have to deal with kind of heavier ideas of morality, so it's going to be mostly just, um, yeah, paint is... Uh, is for good stuff, right? You might want to hold on to that uh, for something that'll happen in just a couple of minutes here. But when it comes to combat, you have the choice of either befriending or thinning out your enemies, and uh, friendly enemies will attack other enemies for you. Oh, that's nice. I can't remember if it was mentioned in the tutorial, but... Uh, your, your melee spin attack does not actually do any damage. That's very intentional, because you have to use <laughs> either paint or thinner. But, you know, there are limited resources, so uh, what do you do if you don't have any of either? Well, you could just break some collect uh, or break some barrels or something, and it'll refill your uh, uh, your paint and thinner gauges. Plus, the, the both the paint and thinner gauges uh, regenerate up to, I think it's a third uh, of your capacity. I see. And, uh, thinning the world, like, I've seen you, uh, um, solving a puzzle already with it. Does the game not judge you for your use of paint and thinner unless it's under particular circumstances? It does judge you. In fact, we're about to get our first judgment right here. Just in case you forgot that Warren Spector worked on this game. Warren, come on now. Oh, yeah. wow, that's, um... Well, I mean, e-tickets are pretty expensive. I don't know. I mean, we could save this gremlin, but that chest over there has 50 e-tickets. That's a lot in the early game. Well, I mean, just a lot, a lot in general. Like, you've seen park prices. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me Mickey Mouse doesn't have a lifetime pass? Well, this is Wasteland. He's a visitor here. But anyway, yeah, I gotta go for the money. Goodbye, Calvin. Ah, hush, Gus. You're not our conscience. You're a pretty shitty conscience. All you're teaching me, Gus, is good people will go through life poor. <laughs> is that really what you want to tell someone who's rated E10 plus? Well, Gus thinks he's in a T-rated game. And that's the, the other main move with either the Pater or the Thinner is a blast. It's effectively a short-range shotgun. Now, uh, what exactly are we gathering all these E-tickets for? 
E-tickets are the main currency. Uh, they will be you know, use them to buy special items, collectibles, uh, occasionally quest items later on in the game. Uh, for those who may not know, E-tickets are, well, Disney used to have a ticket system uh, in the parks and they, those tickets were classified A through E, with E being the highest quality and highest priority. Uh, so that is why the currency in this game is E-tickets. Uh, in fact, some of the, uh, in theme park culture today, any new exciting and interesting ride is usually called an E-ticket attraction, even though that system hasn't been in place for about 30, 40 years. Well, the E stands for excitement. Yeah, you mean it doesn't stand for epic? I was gonna tie it in perfectly. Good. E <laughs> can stand for a number of things. The, the E stands for everybody open your wallets. <laughs> there are different types of E-tickets. Uh, red E-tickets are worth one. There's white, which is worth 10. Green, which is worth 30. There is also a gold e-ticket that's worth 100, but those do not spawn randomly. Those are in specific fixed locations. Mm-hmm. Does this game have any kind of like collect-a-thon mechanic where like you're graded based on how many you, get, you find? Yes. Uh, maybe not as in-depth as something like Banjo-Kazooie, but yes, there there is a, a collect-a-thon aspect to this game. Although we won't see it for a while because this game's intro section is pretty long. Now, every time you spin, like, that's why I go, right? Now, those are a lot of long stairs to go down, or we could just thin out the stairs. Take a shortcut. Whee! But, hmm, what's the screen doing over here? Well, it looks like product placement. I can't believe whoever developed this game let Disney have product placement all over. It's shameful. Yet another gameplay mechanic. We have these 2D traversal levels which uh, is how we get around areas in the world. And each of them is based on a classic Mickey Mouse short or some other kind of Disney media. Uh, this one is based on Mickey and the Beanstalk, which is not actually a separate short. It was part of a, a double feature from the 1940s called Fun and Fancy Free. This was one of two stories that were adapted. And that is a film reel. It's another type of collectible. We're not gonna see what it does for a little bit yet, but uh, Keep an eye out for those. I'll wager it's a uh, film, right? Yes, it is. It looks like film, but uh, unfortunately, we can't really unlock mo many cartoons with that. It's just a separate type of collectible. Well, that's just a, a real bummer. But then we probably would get content flagged if we did try to watch all the cartoons. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, next time we're going to go through Slalom, which, uh, it's an odd name for the area we'll be going through next, but, uh, anyway, so how was your first 25 odd minutes with Epic Mickey? I mean, it looks like a typical Wii platformer of its day right now. I'll tell you, it really didn't feel like 25 minutes. It's almost like time runs faster in that park. 